You're listening to Kayo Conversations, a podcast about anything and everything that matters to Kayo Megas. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our podcast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Leslie Harrington, CEO for Kayo Mega. And today we are talking to new alumna, Ansley Bilyeu, an initiate of the Gamma chapter at Florida State University, where she served as GTB and as a recruitment counselor with FSU Panhellenic. Ansley graduated this past May, earning a degree in international affairs with a concentration in Spanish and a minor in chemistry. She grew up in a Navy family, living in Japan as a child and traveling frequently throughout her childhood, fostering her love for different places, cultures, and purposes. In high school, she started a club that raised funds for Dreams Come True, a wish-granting organization just like Make-A-Wish, Chi Omega's national philanthropy. And in college, she went on to establish the Maji Project, a student organization committed to fighting the global water crisis through education, service, and fundraising. As the founder and president, she led the organization in various community-wide initiatives, including fundraising for 120 portable water filters to be sent to a Tanzanian village. And her servant's heart doesn't stop there. Ansley has devoted her time and talent to multiple service organizations in college and continues to do so today. She's currently applying to medical school with the hopes of one day providing care for the medically underserved in the U.S. and abroad, and she will be spending the next year working as an English teaching assistant in Valencia, Spain. So Ansley... We are pretty thrilled to have you with us today. Welcome to Kyle Conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. This is awesome. I'm super stoked. Well, we are equally stoked. And first mm-hmm. off, we are so proud to be able to call you sister. How did we get so lucky? What about Kai Mega inspired you to join? Yeah, so... Well, to begin, I really don't even feel like it's one of those things where Kai Omega is lucky to call me a sister. I am lucky, lucky and blessed to be a Kai Omega. And that is so true and so represented within my life story, for sure. Um, For me, the way I ended up in Kai O, it's a story really similar to, I think, a lot of our sisters everywhere, is I went through recruitment in 2019. This was before COVID. So like totally in person, all of that. And recruitment was difficult for me. It puts you in a lot of positions of vulnerability and fear, and it's a nervous process. And Chi Omega was the one place that met that vulnerability with comfortability and authenticity. And I like truly felt like I was talking to friends and we talked about super simple things. And then as the week got on, we got to talk about my passions because Chi Omegas are the type of people who ask you about that stuff. And I didn't think that those conversations were like enough to get me a spot in Kayo or whatever yeah. that meant. I was like, this is just talking to friends. This is what I do with my friends from home every day. There's no way that's enough. Felt too easy. And I, that's too yeah. easy. Exactly. And I think that was really representative of what was to come with Kayo and that it is just simple friendship and relationship and all the good stuff that comes with it. So yeah, that's how I ended up with Kayo and I'm super blessed to be one. Oh, well, you said it. I mean, that is it. Friendship in a nutshell. It's that simple and that complex, right? Mm-hmm. Ainsley, tell us yeah, a little bit totally. about your time as GTB so, and recruitment counselor for Panhellenic. Did you learn anything in those mm-hmm. roles that applies to your philanthropic work today? Totally. I think it was all about community within those. So when stepping into a position of leadership, if I've learned anything, is that you are going to get the chance to interact with a super diverse group of people always. And that really within both of those positions, my position of leadership turned into a position of like learning from others. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going into it to bring others something. And I was constantly met with way more than I think I was giving. I hope I led well, but you really just get that much more in return. That was true in the position of GTB where I got to step into a role that I was super passionate about. I really care about academics. I think the opportunity to have higher, higher education is incredible and unmatched. And so to be able to be a part of that story for others was super cool. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, with all of these interactions I was having, I was gaining more friendships that I didn't see coming. With the fellow executive board members, I was gaining more friendships I didn't see coming. And then as a recruitment counselor, you get to interact with 
sisters of chapters all across campus at Florida state. There's 17 different chapters. So I was really meeting people from all over the place. Um, and again, gaining so much more than I was giving. And I think that really speaks to leadership and trying your best to serve from a place of humility and like realization that others do have so much to give. That is so mature. I wish uh, that everyone could learn those lessons um, at a young age like you have, because leadership is about learning from other people and being exposed to different perspectives. And so you got a taste of that early on and it's benefiting you. Totally. And I think that comes from a place of like Chi Omega providing the platform to do that, because I think Chi Omega is mature enough to recognize that and the people who lead it. So they're like, okay, how do we place people in positions where they can experience it too? That's right. So just another example of what a gift it's been. Yeah. Chi Omega knew you were ready, even if you didn't. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, we definitely want to talk about your work with the Maji Project at FSU. Access to clean water is critical um, and it's a global Mm -hmm. issue and something we all are probably guilty of taking for granted. So what led you to become so passionate about this particular problem? Yeah, it's a it's a story I love to tell. So it actually goes back a while ago to the summer following my freshman year of high school. So I was like 15 or 16. And I got the opportunity to travel to Tanzania with a group called Young Life. And it was a Christian based um, philanthropic effort. But we went with already having established some connections over there. So the people leading my trip had lived in Tanzania for many years and they were friends with the people we were going to visit. And so I had the opportunity while there to spend some time in the city, but then also we drove three hours out to the middle of nowhere in Northern Tanzania where the Maasai tribe lives. It's the last um, semi-nomadic tribe on earth, meaning that they don't stay in one place. They move with their cattle as the seasons change. Mm -hmm. And so while there I had the opportunity to kind of live amongst them for a week. They live in these things called bomas, which are like hedges of thorns. And within the boma, it's like a big circle. If you look on Google Maps, you can like see the little circles. Really? And then it's super cool. And then within them is their huts. So we brought our tents into the huts um, where the huts were. And we got to kind of live amongst them for a week. And I was a part of a medical clinic there. We helped lay the foundation of a school Um, But really, we just got to know the people there my freshman year or following my freshman year. And I didn't understand the gravity of the situation yet. And then I returned following my senior year of high school, having already established these friendships um, and really caring about the people there. And at that point, I think I'd grown a little bit wiser. So I was able to see what they were facing. And I felt the gravity of it for the first time. So a story I really like to tell is that I was playing around the Bomo one day with one of my friends, Kimani, he's like a six-year-old little boy, (laughs) and he fell over, scratched his knee. And as we would do instinctually, as people who take water for granted, I was like, oh, come with me. Um, Let's go to the little water spigot that our team has. And I'm just going to clean off his knee, slap on a Band-Aid, call it good, as we all would. So I brought him to the little water spigot. I turned it on and his eyes lit up. And he was amazed by this water. And then all of the other kids around camp started flocking to the water spigot and they were playing in it. And I just didn't understand why so much joy was coming from something that I thought of so instinctually. And I can remember afterwards, like going back to my tent and just crying for a little bit because I was like, I like, I can't believe what I just witnessed. Like, yeah hit me all at Mm -hmm. once. And when you're hit with something like that, you're driven to do something, or I think you should be driven to do something. So leaving Tanzania that time, going into my freshman year of college, realizing the opportunities that were there to bring people into what I'd seen, I was like, something has to be done. We have the opportunity to do something at Florida State. And then within Chi Omega, it just expanded even more. Um, So it all started from this little village in Tanzania that I hope to go back to again and again. And I'm still in cahoots with them (laughs) on WhatsApp. We talk all the time. Like I see them as friends that I'm just trying to do my best to use my resources to help them in the same way that I know they would use their resources to help me. Our resources just look different. That is so profound what you just said. But help me understand, because the problem seems far bigger than a high school or college student 
I mean, how did you even start without feeling and pun intended that you were boiling the ocean? Like huge problem. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Um, that was something I definitely faced at the beginning was yes, I have with knowing that you have so many opportunities, it can be incapacitating. Um, and I think someone had told me my freshman year of college, like, just do one little thing, just start with one little thing. And I was like, okay, my one little thing is going to be signing up to make a student organization. Yeah. And then from there, do one more little thing, talk to whoever else might want to be a part of that organization. So I think that applies to anything that you're passionate about, any problem that you see, just do one little thing and see where it leads. And maybe it stops. Maybe, maybe you've got to change that one little thing and do something else. Um, but I think that's how I took it on was what's one thing, one step at a time that I can do to make a difference. And we clearly haven't solved the global water crisis by yeah. any means, but we've done our one individual little things and anything that we've done has been a gain. Nothing's been a loss. So it's, it's better than it would have been without anything. So yeah, that's my little piece of advice, I guess, is just take your one little step. Well, baby steps and one little thing matters. It makes an impact. Even yes. a little one is important. Yep. Has a ripple effect for sure. Pun intended as well. <laughs> now, what part did your Chi Omega sisters play in helping you with all this? Everything. Yeah. Um, yeah it's so cool to think about. Like, I was 18 years old. Everyone I was with at that point was 18 year olds. Um, it was a lot of the community that I had found my freshman year of college who stepped up and were willing to take on this effort with me. They already a few months in knew my heart and loved me enough to be like, I'm not necessarily passionate about the global water crisis, but I'm passionate about supporting you. So I'll do what it is that I need to do to help you. And so I'll never forget um, the first meeting of the Maji Project was in the lobby of my dorm room. And it looked like me and a couple of my Kayo sisters, a couple being freshmen like me, and then also some juniors and seniors who were already mentoring me at that point. And I think they just showed up to support me. Um, but it was actually those people who ended up making up the first executive board of the Mashi project. So in a lot of ways, it started as a very Chi Omega supported effort. And as time has gone on, as the organization has evolved, a lot of other Greek organizations have been a part of it too, and people not in Greek life. And the current executive board's president, president, sorry, is not a Kayo. She's a Gamify. So it's been really cool how not only has Chi Omega been the reason that it could happen, because without an executive board, you can't do anything. All right. Um, <laughs> but it's been all of Greek life who's really poured into it for sure. Well, there's something to that. Uh, I have a daughter in college now, and I tell her just, you know, if anybody invites you anywhere, go. Because you don't know who you'll yeah. meet or what you'll learn. And it sounds like these people came to support you because they love you. And through you and your influence, they're helping the world. Yes. And also, I'll add to yeah. that. What I've seen is that a lot of people have joined Maji, become a part of it, and then said, again, I'm not super passionate about the global water crisis, but I am really passionate about access to fill in the blank, healthcare, light, like whatever yeah. it is. I'm going to go pursue that. Or you started a student organization. I'm really passionate about one of my sisters in Kayo. She actually started an organization um, dedicated to her mom who fought breast cancer. Okay. And she came to me and she said, how do I start a student organization? Mm -hmm. You're really passionate about what you're doing. I'm passionate about what I'm doing. How do we start this? So, and again, it's the ripple effect. You do one thing with your own passion and it might inspire others to pursue theirs in a different way. And so I think that's something that came of it too, is not just impacting the global water crisis, but giving people the platform to pursue their own passions. There's that ripple effect you talk about and pun intended mm -hmm. again. Uh, mm -hmm. This is just so punny, but it works. <laughs> now, uh, these conversations that you're having, I can see why somebody would seek your advice because asking for money sometimes and support is not easy. So what tips or techniques do you have when having those kind of difficult, uncomfortable conversations? Yeah, totally. I think it comes from humanizing the problem, mm -hmm. from putting the person before the problem and saying, we're not just trying to fight this abstract global water crisis. I'm trying to help my friend Kimani, who lives in Tanzania and doesn't have access to water. Yeah. So the ways you do that, storytelling, telling those stories, 
helping introduce your friends to the friends who are facing the problem. So maybe that's like showing the text messages that you have. Maybe that's FaceTiming my friend Gideon in Tanzania, who literally on WhatsApp, like shows me his house <laughs> and he's, he's super close with my mom too. And he has our, sorry, our names carved into his hut, yeah. like super cool dude. And so trying to show people why it is that you're passionate. And when you're passionate about it because of the people, show them the people and they'll kind of see that too. And where you see that and where you can tell it's authentic and it's community driven and that it's not some savior complex, but again, it's just friends trying to help friends. People understand that and they want to support it. Well, it makes it smaller. It makes it personal. Yeah, you know those people. Well, what can we do? The podcasters listening today, uh, what are some ways we can all do our part to help ensure clean water access for everybody? Totally. Um, so I think it starts with just being aware of the problem. I know that sounds cliche yeah. and the issue and the prob- like the solution that everyone throws at people when you ask this kind of question, but it's true. Just be aware. Start telling other people about it. Start yeah. telling your kids like start pouring into the youth and informing the youth because the youth are what's going to shape everything so start really investing in them um and then there's of course the little steps that you can take like showering for shorter amounts of time and (laughs) using the dishwasher actually instead of your sink to do dishes um things like that the little steps that you can take and then there's also bigger steps so if you're listening to this and you're like i care about this i know people who are facing this problem and i I want to be a part of it in a bigger way, then look around where you're at and find what other organizations are also fighting the global water crisis. Because the Maji Project is not alone. If you look up your city, the global water crisis and philanthropy, you're probably going to find something. Um, One of the cool things about being a part of the Maji Maji Project is we were able to bring in a lot of guest speakers and to work with a lot of other organizations Mm -hmm. fighting after the same thing. So look into what's around you, see how you can get involved there. And you can turn it into your career. You can turn it into a hobby. You can turn it into something you're just more conscious of. Um, Either of those works. Ainsley, thank you so much for talking with us today. Did we leave anything out or do you have anything else that you want to share before we go? Oh, gosh. Um, No, I don't think we left anything out. We covered a lot. But I will say, number one, thank you for being willing to have me on. And thanks to you and your whole team and everyone at Cayo for kind of in the same way investing in youth because college kids are youth. It's a super critical time for everyone. And the impact that Cayo Omega has had on my life and my personality and who I am and my confidence But then also what I've been able to do is just absolutely unparalleled. So thank you for doing what you're doing, because it's obviously having a really large impact on people. Um, And then I think as just like a lasting comment, I guess, would be to, again, take the time to reflect on what it is you're passionate about. Doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't need to be a philanthropic effort at all. It could be growing plants or brewing beer. I don't know. Like it could literally be anything, but just figure out what it is that you're passionate about and then chase that because with passion and purpose comes plans and then plans comes change like we talked about. So I think figure out what you're passionate about and really chase after it and bring people in to do it with you because it's it's more fun with community too. That's that's what I would say. Well, you are such an inspiration and I feel like we need to say thank you for saying yes to Kai Omega. What a wise investment, pun intended again, um, Kai Uh Mega has made in you and our podcasters have made listening to you today. Uh, If you haven't already, be sure to follow us on social media because I want everyone to like, comment, and share Kaio Conversations with your friends. And podcasters, if you've missed any of our past episodes, please go to our website at kaiomega.com to hear from some other amazing sisters like Ansley and incredible friends of Kai Omega. Uh, if you know of somebody with a great story, please recommend guests to us by emailing kaiomega at kaiomega.com. And thank you for tuning in. We'll see you for another Kai Conversation next time.